Hello, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Sarah Barclay. I'm one of the directors of the Medical Mediation Foundation. And just to give you an idea of what we do, we set up 10 years ago to offer uh, mediation and training for health professionals in recognizing and managing conflict. And since then, we have built on that. We started mainly working in pediatrics. Since then, we've expanded the work that we do to work with adult teams. And we also work with uh, clinicians and colleagues in recognizing and managing conflict. We've tried over the years to make sure that everything we do is evidence-based. So we started by doing research, mainly focused in the area of pediatrics, um, and have published along the way, since we thought it was very important to have that evidence base. And we're currently working in three big children's hospitals to embed a pathway for recognizing and managing conflict as a team and to support health professionals to work with and collaborate with patients and families in recognizing and managing conflict. And very briefly, I came to this work from 15 years working at the BBC as a medical journalist. And it was really as a result of making a fair number of films that involved conflict of some kind or another between parents, patients, professionals, that made me want to offer something more supportive and productive when those situations arose. So I trained as a mediator and have been focusing on this work ever since. What we're going to do today is to give you an introduction to managing conflict and to think about some of the strategies that we use and then we hope that some of you will want to join the courses the two courses that we won run one in recognizing and managing conflict with patients and the other recognizing and managing conflict with colleagues and we'll give you the details of those um, at the end of the webinar so I'm delighted to uh, hand over to my fellow director Oscar yeah hi uh... Hi everybody, I'll put our photos up on the screen for you. Um, really nice to, to be here with you. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Sarah's uh, co-director at MMF. Uh, my background is slightly different to Sarah's. I um, come from a legal background, so I'm a barrister by training, and I specialize in healthcare law. But the thing that got me into this particular area of the world is uh, working at the General Medical Council. So I worked for the GMC in the Fitness to Practice Department as a senior prosecutor for a few years before running a mediation pilot program for them. And um, it was a really interesting experience because I, I sat in uh, you know, small rooms with doctors from you know, brand new doctors just qualified all the way through to um, very senior doctors, medical directors, clinical directors. And, and the thing that really struck me doing that was it didn't matter how senior people were. And it didn't matter whether or not they'd done something wrong. The weight of uh, the, the whole experience on them was so huge. Um, and at looking at the files across, across my desk, communication and communication breakdown was at the centre of, of a large number of them, which is what got me working directly uh, uh, with hospitals and Royal Colleges and uh, the MDU, et cetera, since then. So brilliant to be here with you and, uh, and hope this is an interesting hour session for you. Uh, let's introduce Claire as well. <laughs> Thank you, Oscar. Thank you for tuning in, everyone. My name's Claire Sieber and I am a practicing GP down in West Sussex and I'm also an associate trainer and mediator with the Medical Mediation Foundation. Uh, I specialize in uh, conflict in primary care, particularly I have an interest in commercial GP partnership disputes and I'm going to give you some tips later which I hope you find useful. Thank you. Oscar, okay. back to you. Thanks, Claire. Um, so just a, a little bit of admin uh, before we start. So we're going to be using Mentimeter uh, today. So what you'll need to do, either in a browser window or on your phone, go to menti.com, so M-E-N-T-I.com, and enter the code in front of you on the screen. And it should show you the presentation. And we use that as a way of collecting large amounts of data in word clouds, uh, which we're going to do in a minute. Uh, other, other bits of admin, uh, please do ask questions. Uh, there's a question box uh, in front of you. Uh, and do do it as we go, because we're going to have a 20 minute Q&A at the end. And it'd be good to have a, a nice number of questions to dig into when we get there. You're going to get a certificate of attendance after this. It's not quite CPD, but you get a certificate that um, Charlie from the MDU will send out next week. Um, yeah, and I think that is all, that is all the admin. In terms of a bit of structure behind what you're going to see today, we're first going to look at understanding ourselves in conflict and what conflict does to us. 
recognizing the warning signs of conflict and how to engage with others in those early stages to try and avoid it when it happens. So that's the first bit. But then we look at the mediation process and what it can offer, and then um, look at managing conflicts, particularly from a GP's perspective in and after the pandemic. So and then that'll take us about 40 minutes, and then we'll have a 20 minute Q&A after the event. So I hope that looks like an interesting use of the next uh, 55 minutes. And we're gonna start by this, with this thought provoking quote, Sarah. Thank you, Oscar. Yes, we wanted to start with this quote from um, Atul Gawande, who's um, an American doctor and a writer of many fantastic books about medicine and particularly about the human factors in medicine. Um, and it's a quote that we often use in our training because so many health professionals have told us that they feel more comfortable when they're able to solve a problem, offer a solution, give information about what needs to happen to make things better. But as this quote says, what happens if there isn't a fix, if there isn't a solution? And conflict takes us into that zone, I think. It takes us out of our comfort zone because so often conflict is about fear and emotion. And to de-escalate it, we often have to step into the shoes of a patient or a colleague and explore what things look like from their perspective, which is not very easy when you're in the middle of a conflict. And when lockdown began last year, this quote seemed even more relevant because we were all in the unfixable zone now. And those conflicts weren't necessarily with patients or families. They were about the conflicting emotions that all of us were feeling as we entered this really uncharted territory. And of course, the dynamics have changed since then. The public outpouring of gratitude we used to see with that weekly clap for the NHS has been replaced to some extent by frustration, by complaints, by burnout, by increasingly long waiting lists. And, and for many people, I think that uncertainty and fear, whether it's professionals or patients, remains. And, and we've all had to find our own language and strategies for navigating that and for managing it. Oscar. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. So um, we're gonna look at the Mentimeters now just to get a little bit of an idea from you as to your experience of of some of this so first off i'd be interested to ask you what impact the pandemic has had on your relationship with your colleagues so this should be fairly straightforward to do so if you go to menti.com and enter that code you should be presented with a word cloud uh, uh, the opportunity to put some words in so you short phrases or single words about the impact of your of the pandemic on your relationship with colleagues. And you will form your own uh, kind of um, view, I suppose, as you see this word cloud being put together. But immediately you, you see what we tend to see here, which is a, which is a very much a spectrum of two sides. So some people say pulled together, more supportive, um, and other people saying fractured, uh, disconnected and distanced. And I think that that is very much the impression that we get working with clinical teams at the moment, that in some ways, especially in the early days, things have pulled together, but it's also, it, there, is a, there are also challenges as a result of, of this coming up. And you can see a nice big word cloud appearing there. Um, I'll open it to, to Sarah and to Claire. Is there anything that you're, you're picking up, you're seeing as a result of this forming? It's extraordinary, isn't it? And I was just seeing stress in the middle. Obviously, the, the, the more people enter a particular word, um, the, the, the bigger the, the font. But that sense of disconnection, of strain and distance, I actually was really struck. Somebody had put the word hate um, in there, which I think is really honest and needs to be acknowledged. Um, and, and really thinking about where does conflict take us to? Um, and, and of course, as a result of that, thinking how important it is to manage it, but acknowledging the impact is the, our first step, I think. Yeah. And then you see yeah. the two ones, the stress and supportive, sitting alongside each other right in the centre. One yeah. of the things that people said to us in our work is that they've missed those um, nutritional, uh, incidental engagements with, that they normally have with their colleagues, if it's in the lift or in the coffee, in the coffee room those are, are not so much there anymore for everybody. And so that can be a real challenge too. 
Thank you very much, everybody. A, a great cloud coming in. Same question, really, but I wonder if, if, if the answer is different. What about with your patients? And isn't it interesting, again, sim similar thing coming through of, of a very mixed picture. Um, I think the first few were strained and supported, again. And then we've got that contrast between some people saying better relationships and then other people saying actually they're able to be, they're feeling less empathic than before. So it's a real mixture, isn't it? Yeah, and we got... Clever. Go Sorry, yeah, we got some people feeling blamed and then some people feeling pity as well. Those are quite difficult emotions to handle as a doctor. Yeah. And I think um, reflective of the enormous spectrum of responses people have had, both professionally and personally, over the course of the 80, last 18 months, I worked with a consulting group a couple of months ago and I said, you know, how are things going? And one person said that they felt like they've been living in prison and another person had said they've never felt more free. And that's within a uh, you know, a sample set of eight. So there's, there's a there's a huge spectrum going on here, I think. And this influences very much how we, the, the conflict that arises, I think, between people, both in terms of your relationship with patients and with colleagues. Thank you very much, everybody. We're going to go to the next slide now. So this is our last Mentimeter here. And this is kind of drilling down, I suppose, into conflict and what it does. What we'd like you to do is think about a time that you've had a conflict or a disagreement or a tension with a patient or a colleague that don't necessarily go to your kind of uh, 10 out of 10 conflict. Maybe think of a kind of six or a, a five or a six. We're interested in the thoughts, feelings, emotions and physical sensations that arose within you as a result of being in conflict. I see there are some questions coming in about do you have to stop? the presentation to engage with this. You don't need to. It's easiest if you do it on your phone, probably, or in a browser window. When we do the substantive sessions, we spend quite a lot of time on, on this topic. Uh, because there's so much to say about it. Um, but you see with this, this word cloud, what I'm noticing at least is the depth of emotion that, that occurs when people are involved in conflict. One of the first words there was rage. I can't think of a, perhaps a stronger response to a situation than rage. Disappointment, frustration. Equally, Please, Claire. Equally some very strong physical responses as well, haven't we? We've got palpitations, tearfulness, exhaustion. Yeah, that sense of helplessness too. Mm. And vulnerability, which we hear a lot about. And there's also the professional sense of, 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 of almost not indignation, perhaps, but you know, what does this say about me professionally that, this, that I find myself in this place? But as if you look at that, that cloud, the thing I notice at least is that there's a pretty tight correlation here around the kind of responses that people are having. There's lots of people feeling pretty, pretty similar sets of feelings. And I suppose the thing that we take from this when we work in, in conflict and we work with people on both sides of conflict is that you may be feeling these feelings in response to that conflict situation, but it's very likely that the person who you're in conflict with, be it a patient or a colleague, is going to be feeling a pretty similar array of, of emotions. If you look at that list, it fits the patient experience possibly too. Thank you very much, everyone. And our, our takeaway, where, where this leads us, I suppose, is into is, is best made, I think, by by Maya Angelou, who you, you may well know as the uh, recently deceased American poet. And she said that I've learned that people will forget what you've said, 
people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So that's very much the territory that we're in with conflict resolution. It's a feelings conversation because it's about people's emotional narratives and emotional landscapes. And to take us on from that, I'm going to hand over to Sarah, who's going to tell you about the, the, the PIN model. So we found, and Oscar, I now can't see the slides, so I can see my script, but I'm assuming we're seeing the iceberg on the screen. Oh. Um, we found this visual model, which we've called the PIN model, Positions, Interests and Needs, really helpful in trying to support us to acknowledge those really complex layers of emotion which are activated when people feel they're not being listened to or heard or just being told that their point of view is wrong. So on the surface, on that tip of the iceberg, what we're seeing is often extreme emotion, for example, anger, aggression, or attack. And if that's directed at us, our instinct is often to respond in the same way, that activate that amygdala hijack response, flight or fight or flight response. And the consequence of that is often that conflict escalates because what we're doing effectively is kind of um, hitting one tip of the iceberg with another in our response. A more helpful response, if we can train ourselves to do this and be in a position where we're able to do that, is to be able to step, take a step back and think about what lies beneath the surface of that iceberg. And what lies beneath is interests, so what we need and want to happen in order to make ourselves feel better or for the conflict to go away. And right at the bottom there, needs. And those are human needs for anyone who's familiar with the Maslow hierarchy of needs. Those are needs that we all share as human beings. So that need to feel safe and secure, wanted, loved, all of those things. So right at the bottom of the iceberg, which is what we're not seeing most of the time, are things which unite us rather than divide us. And in conflict, the real challenge is to be able to get below the surface and be willing to, to dig and explore and be curious and find out what's going on underneath. So we started when we began this work and our work initially was focused in paediatrics. Um, we wanted to try and understand what those triggers in, com in healthcare conflict were and whether there were any patterns of escalation. So we interviewed a sample of just under 50 professionals, lawyers, parents, clinical ethicists, um, hospital chaplaincy teams, really people who'd had direct experience in one way or another um, of a conflict and at different levels of severity. And when those interviews were analysed, they showed really clear phases of escalation and identified some key triggers, warning signs and consequences. So in the first zone, the green zone, and we turned it into a, a hope and easy to understand traffic light pathway, the focus is really on being aware of what can trigger conflict. So here, things in sensitive language, from getting someone's name wrong to using complicated medical jargon and, for example, describing further treatment as futile, to inconsistencies in communication, making assumptions about a patient or colleague, for example, describing them as difficult when it might actually be the situation that's difficult rather than the person. Um, and all of those things are the backstory, history of unresolved conflict, there might have been a previous clinical error. All of these things were identified as key triggers for potential conflict. Then when we start to move up the pathway into that middle zone, the amber phase, um, some really clear warning signs were identified and positions begin to feel very entrenched conversations or meetings start to be avoided. We often see that micromanaging or controlling behaviours emerge, whether it's if you're um, a, a, as a doctor being stood over while you're putting in cannulas, being questioned about your professional expertise, all of which can feel very challenging and it begins to feel a bit like a battlefield. And the reason we've got this little elephant lurking in the corner is because very often everyone knows it's there but nobody quite wants to acknowledge its presence. And the bad news is that that elephant will not go away. Um, in fact, it tends to get bigger unless we acknowledge that it's there, um, which can feel very challenging 
when you're in that conflict zone. And the final zone is the red zone. And really here, we're looking at the consequences of conflict in healthcare, which have been left unrecognized or, or unmanaged so that it's often the patient who becomes the victim, particularly when the conflict is between uh, parents and professionals. And we saw that most recently, for example, in the Charlie Gard and Alfie Evans cases. But it would also be relevant where, for instance, a patient is torn between other family members in conflict. So at its most extreme, those verbal or physical threats and attack attacks can also be the consequence of conflict, which is escalated. And we hope that the pathway, really the purpose of it, was, was to make it easier to identify those triggers and warning signs um, in the hope that we can prompt early recognition, early acknowledgement and early action. And the next thing we wanted to look at is to try and understand why conflict occurs in the first place in order to try and find a way through it. Oscar. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so finding a way through conflict with an evocative maze, I think. Um, so lots of these slides that are going to follow now are taken from some really interesting work by the Harvard Negotiation Project who looked in depth at, at why conflict emerges within us in the first place and why we react to it in the way that we do. And this uh, is a simple idea, I think, but possibly the most resonant with me when I work in conflict. And this is the idea that we commonly, as human beings, make assumptions about people's intent based upon its impact on us. So what you've got here in this, in this uh, diagram is the column on the left, which is the bits that we're aware of as individuals, which are your own intentions and other people's impact on you. But the right hand column, the bits you're not aware of because you're not in people's heads, you're not aware of other people's intentions and you're not aware of your impact on them. And what we see in, as mediators is often that in conflict, people project into that right hand column what they fear may be there. So in the absence of knowing what's there, there there's a projection into that gray of, of the most nefarious thing. And as, a, as, a, as an experience as a mediator, what will often happen is we'll go and see one person who will um, seem perfectly rational and pleasant and say that the other person has lied to them and, and, and been um, causing them extreme difficulty. And then we'll go and meet the other person who will also seem perfectly rational and perfectly nice and describe the other person in the same way. And what's commonly happening is that mutual projection into that right-hand column about what they fear uh, might exist there. So, uh, a, a voting bit in Mentimeter for you. And I would just be interested in your response here. Do you think that conflict is about who's right and who's wrong? Is it kind of fundamentally about who's right and who's wrong? as you're filling this out i'd also say please do put questions for the q a if you'd like in the question box because we can select from them um, as we go it's one comment uh, from shams thanks very much shams uh going back to sarah's pathway we said i really like how an individual's name is really important in the green area that's something that we talk a lot, a lot about on the on the substantive course yeah. So the results are coming in. This is where it feels like a bit like a game show. Um, but yeah, a bit of a split, but overwhelmingly people saying that it's not fundamentally about right and wrong. And, you know, 30 out of against 210 saying, actually, no, we think conflict really is fundamentally about right and wrong. Well, I think this is a really interesting question. And Harvard wrote a lot about this. And what they said was, in, in their view, based upon their research, conflict is not about who is right and who is wrong. Instead, what it's normally about is a complex and murky interplay between past experience, value judgments, um, childhood experiences, um, uh, loss, uh, and all of these kind of under the pin model iceberg, all the feelings. That's what really conflict is normally about is people looking at the same set of data or the same landscape and reaching different conclusions based upon what they see. That's at the heart of, of what goes on in most conflict. 
But that can be a slightly confronting idea, I think, for people, because yes, there are times where you can be right about something, kind of factually right. Um, take, for example, you have a 14 year old daughter who started smoking. Should she be smoking? The answer is almost, uh, you know, unequivocally, no, she should not be smoking. But the thing about conflict resolution is that that doesn't get you anywhere. You, you can be right about something, but still stuck in that same cycle and wrestling match and un unable to move anywhere further forward. So being right is fine, but it doesn't allow you to gain any traction through it. So that's, that's the thing about right and wrong in conflict. And one of the key ideas, and I kind of slightly ashamed that I was kind of completely floored by this when I read this uh, in, the, in the Harvard material, this is why we don't get anywhere when we're in conflict, because we think we've got it right and that the other person is being a problem or is the problem. They think they have it right and that we're the problem. And that the main thing here is that neither person's conclusion makes sense to the other person. And that's why we get stuck in this rut, effectively. And Harvard have this lovely, lovely idea, I think, about conflict is that it's a fundamentally it's a feelings business. Going back to that Maya Angelou quote, that engaging in solving conflict without talking about feelings is like staging an opera without music. You'll get the plot, but you'll miss the point. And I think that really nicely sums up kind of where we are in conflict and, and what, what we experience as mediators on a day-to-day -day basis. So to summarize it with the bulls, you're gonna have conflict in your work. It's absolutely, it's gonna be unavoidable in, in the work that you do especially, but how you go about it, the combat is the optional element of it. Uh, that brings us on to, to finding a little bit more about mediation, about how we work as mediators. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you. So when might you call for one of us um, and what do we do? I think that one of the most difficult aspects of conflict is to be able to acknowledge that it's almost impossible to mediate your own conflict because you're right in the middle of it and it feels horrible and you can't really see a way through it. But health professionals have often said to us that they think they should be able to resolve differences of opinion, particularly with patients or families. And I think perhaps that's particularly true in pediatrics as well, perhaps less so with colleagues. So we often get asked to mediate at a point where a conflict has been going on for weeks or months and sometimes with clinical teams for years. And that sense that somehow if you can't sort out your own conflict that you failed is something we see very often. Whereas we would say actually asking for help is a sign of strength and is a sign of really wanting to move forward. So what is mediation essentially and this is a real whistle st uh, whistle stop tour through it it's designed to be a really flexible process um, to help those people who are in conflict to acknowledge even if they don't agree with each other's point of view and support them to find a way forward which they're all able to accept mediators don't make decisions our role is to support facilitate conversations that might not otherwise be able to happen and to help parties in a conflict to make decisions together. And really importantly, a mediator is neutral and mediation is voluntary and confidential. You can't force people to the table in mediation. They need to want to be there um, and to try and resolve issues, to be willing to engage in the process. So when might you consider it? there comes a point in conflict where the situation feels as if it's become so entrenched and so difficult that it doesn't seem possible to resolve without external help or support. And health professionals often say to us that asking for mediation is that sign of weakness or, or failure, but actually acknowledging that a conflict has reached a point where it needs professional intervention means that that first really important step has been taken towards managing it and hopefully resolving it 
And there are skills which you can learn, which will also give you the confidence to engage more proactively with conflict. And that's really what we look at in the two courses that we run um, with the MDU, one uh, with looking at conflict with patients and the other looking at conflict with colleagues. And we're going to give you both of our next courses are in November and we'll give you the links to that um, at the end of the at the end of the webinar. Brilliant, Oscar. thank you. Um, a, a question that I've just seen come in, which is relevant to this bit in particular, is someone saying, what does legally privileged mean? Can you can you help with that one? Oh, so so legally privileged means that when, when people agree to engage in mediation, they all are asked to sign a confidentiality agreement. And essentially what that says is that the what happens in a mediation, what is said in a mediation, um, is not to be shared with anybody else and can't be used to form the basis of legal action unless all parties agree that the information should be shared. If you reach an agreement um, and that, mean, that agreement is written up and that can be shared, um, but the contents, the purpose of mediation is to allow a different kind of space where things could be said, for example, apologies could be given, but those can't be used against any of the parties in a legal process. Wonderful, very comprehensive. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, we're now gonna move on to hear from Claire, who, who as she introduced herself, is a GP and mediator to give her perspective on what she's seen um, over the course of the last uh, year and a bit. Thank you, Oscar. So I've got perhaps 10, 15 minutes maybe to talk to you about my view from being a practicing GP and also as a mediator. And I very much feel that working clinically in the NHS at the moment is tense, and so do you, according to those word clouds that we saw earlier. The workload is huge. Uh, it feels more risky, seat of your pants type stuff some of the time. And it's quite different, at least for me, from the job that I actually trained for. Uh, of course, we've all adapted marvellously, but there has been some costs. Uh, a lot of our colleagues are suffering with burnout or compassion fatigue or COVID or long COVID. Um, we all grapple with the everyday anxiety, I'm sure, of missing something serious because we've managed a patient remotely. And at the same time, we've got some patients and some politicians who are complaining about not being able to get a face-to-face -face appointment without any triage. And so you might just say, well, for everyone's sake, why don't we just start doing that again? Yet there's simply not the capacity, and we all know that, to be able to do that, either within the physical NHS estate or within the resources that we have. Secondary care is under enormous strain too. Patients are waiting far longer than they used to for outpatient assessments. And in the meantime, the GPs are holding some of that risk and trying to manage the patient as best as uh, they can. Uh, we're even getting into horrible conflicts with patients who don't want to wear masks. Um, I think we all feel that there's an absolute tsunami of complaints and GMC and NHS England level investigations coming our way. And from a team point of view, well, I'm certainly seeing more conflict between colleagues, which is where the focus of my mediation work is at the moment than before. Uh, partnership disputes or workplace disputes that have either been triggered by COVID or have been made worse by COVID. For example, if staff members have been shielding and the team has been physically separated for a while, well, then that's not going to be a good recipe. Uh, some people are feeling the workload is now not distributed as evenly as it once was. Some people will be off on long-term sick leave. We've got lots of GPs across the country dusting off their partnership agreements, trying to work out whether they can force someone to retire or perhaps pay themselves in a slightly different way now that everyone's doing a different job. We're trying to protect our staff from COVID. So the whole staff social events and perhaps even the coffee meetings that we once used to do are just that little bit more difficult now. You know, even if we're all able to meet, we'll still be sitting that bit further apart, probably wearing masks. It's just a lot more difficult to keep the teams in a good place. So here are some tips of mine. Firstly, to avoid and secondly, to resolve disputes in this new normal that we're now in, whether that be with a patient or between colleagues. So let's start with patients. And I don't have a magic bullet to all of the horrible pressure that we're facing every day that I just talked about. 
Um, and it's impossible to avoid conflict with patients completely. It would be a very strange day indeed for me if I didn't have some sort of co conflict with a patient. So I suppose my first bit of advice is to look after yourself. Conflict is normal. And what we've also seen is that feeling uncomfortable in conflict is also normal. You're not a bad doctor for being in conflict or feeling that way. I think it's useful to think back to the traffic light system that Sarah talked about and the things that can happen when you're in the green zone that can get patients backs up a little bit and whether you can either take steps to avoid them or just be aware that they exist so that you can anticipate where there could be some causes of tension and some of you have alluded to this in the, the, um, the chat box as well. So. Running late, for example, is inevitable, but there's no reason not to thank the patient for waiting. I find that diffuses things nicely and works better for me than apologising for running late, putting the onus on them and saying thank you for waiting. Uh, some clinical teams will give patients a really specific time that they will be seen or receiving a call, and I can understand why that works better for other teams that prefer to just give a sort of vague time slot but either way, patients can find both of those systems frustrating to navigate. Some patients, as we've said before, want to book the face-to-face -face appointments without being triaged, and most of us aren't allowing that at the moment. And I find by saying something like, I'm here right now on the phone so we can have a really detailed chat about your problem, and hopefully there are some things that we can start doing right away to sort out your problem rather than you having to wait, diffuses the situation some of the time. I'm sure you've all got your own scripts for those sorts of situations. If you don't, I suggest you get one because those situations are happening all the time. I find myself apologizing a lot. I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry you're having to wait so long because of the situation the NHS is in. I'm sorry that I don't have any other treatments that we can try in the meantime. And I don't mind saying sorry. Apologies are easy to give and they're free and I'm not scared of using them. You know, I didn't become a doctor to deliberately put up barriers to patients accessing healthcare, quite the opposite in fact. So I feel comfortable to apologize that those are there at the moment. I also find that patients don't listen as well or perhaps understand what I'm trying to tell them on the phone or virtually by video as they used to do face to face. I find I have to use even plainer English than I would have done before and use text and email services a lot. Uh, for sending leaflets to reinforce what I've told them on the phone. In fact, I use leaflets a lot more than I ever used to, anything to avoid misunderstandings. But get savvy with your technology so that those things are easy for you to do and don't take a heap more time. So if we think about Teams now. Okay. Again, conflict is an inevitable part of our business lives. Uh, you could even argue that an element of disagreement is, ne disagreement is necessary for a team to function. But here are some tips of mine. Firstly, your agreements, so your partnership agreements, your PCN agreements, your staff handbook, your employment contracts, your agreement that governs how your clinical team makes decisions. Firstly, make sure you have one. <laughs> and then secondly, make sure that it's up to date. So it's signed by everyone that needs to sign it. So it's actually valid. Uh, make sure it covers everything you're already doing and everything you would like it to cover so it's actually going to be relevant for you as well. And it's simple that if you've got a valid agreement, there's just less to argue about in the first place anyway. But if you do come to a conflict, that agreement might even give you a template for how to resolve it as well. So there's two reasons why it's helpful. And the majority of disputes, sadly, that I get involved in are ones where there isn't a valid agreement governing how the, the people work together. So there's nothing to start from. Socialising, it's so important, not, and not just for our own mental well-being and for that of the team, but you need disagreements and the culture of dealing with them constructively for a team to function. You've got to be able to have debates about issues and people need to be able to speak up when there's an issue early on without letting it fester. And to establish that sort of culture, you need to build some trust and some inclusion in your team. You need to be getting together, being open and honest, not necessarily about work, but about your, your personal values, your passions, your hobbies, swapping photos of your grandchildren. 
It's those sort of things that will get teams into a place where they can communicate effectively if something goes wrong. And let's face it, it's just so much harder to have a bit of dispute with somebody that you're meeting regularly for coffee as well. When it comes to decision making, even if you're just a clinical team and you're not running a business, there does need to be some governance agreed for how you do that as a team. When are you going to meet? How are you going to set an agenda? How much weight do people's votes bring? Are you going to minute the meetings? How are you going to communicate the outcomes? That sort of thing. And you might say that that's unnecessary bureaucracy, but I have seen people who've gone to those sorts of lengths, even to the lengths of having minutes approved by everyone who's attended. And it's really, really, save their bacon because there's been such a clear indisputable record of something that's happened and that the thing that happened was in accordance with a process that everyone had previously agreed to it's really helpful if you've got that i hate to tell you the number of disputes i get involved in where people aren't meeting regularly at all never mind socially now i'm thinking about to run a business or a clinical team sometimes it's been years since they all met and you can see why that is just going to breed miscommunication and misunderstanding and people feeling left out. So do meet regularly. So if we move on to how to resolve a conflict, if you've unfortunately not been able to avoid it and it's there happening in front of you, well, you need to spot the early warning signs and get in there as soon as possible. The earlier you get help, the better, because people will be less fixed in their positions and have invested less time and energy and perhaps even legal fees in getting to that point so you'll be able to get people to compromise more easily and as has been illustrated so nicely by oscar and sarah conflict is all about emotions and they will never be resolved unless you embrace the emotions apologies and acknowledgement acknowledgements or even just having the opportunity to air how something made you feel can really help and get people off on the right footing when it comes to getting a solution you must try to look underneath that iceberg and understand what everybody wants what everyone needs what everyone's worried about even better try to understand understand what they would be prepared to accept as a solution if you're personally involved in a dispute, make sure you've thought about what that what you want from yourself out of the dispute, because it's not uncommon for people in a dispute to not have thought that far ahead and to have just become fixed on their own position. And what I can guarantee you is that if, that if you do do that and you explore what's underneath the iceberg for everybody, is that you will find some common ground, even if it's a teeny tiny thing, that you can start to build things on. It might just be one simple thing that everybody doesn't want, but there will be something there in common and then you can build things up from that. And when it comes to resolving the issues, do think outside of the box. You don't have to be limited by what's in your partnership agreement or perhaps even just precedent of how you've handled something before. A court of law can order just a couple of things, a bit of money transacting or maybe somebody adhering to a contract. But in a mediation or any sort of negotiation, you can include all sorts of creative things. Uh, you can think about reputational issues and agree some wording of some messaging that's going out. You can think about creative ways of using people's job titles and the team structure. You can creatively use, use notice periods, all sorts of things you can do that often don't cost a lot, but can mean a lot to the other person. And if you do come to an agreement, and this is most important of all and sometimes forgotten, but the last thing you want to be doing is arguing about what you've agreed on. And it does happen, sadly. The temptation can be at the end of a very long, awful discussion to just get up and walk away after somebody's quickly summarised what's been agreed. But it's really important while everyone's still there to get it down on paper so everyone's agreed about the wording of it. And it's very clear who's going to do what. And most importantly of all, you need to make sure that you review your agreement and set the date for reviewing that agreement before you get up and leave. Otherwise, it either won't happen or it'll happen too late. And my final tip is if you're working in primary care is to involve your LMC, your local medical committee. They're the experts in providing pragmatic support to practices and disputes. And of course, that's included within the levy. 
they'll have seen it all before and seen what can work and what doesn't work so they can help you think creatively about how to how to resolve it if you're struggling to do that they will even help you have conversations with the ccg who may need to be involved or who may and you didn't hear this from me may even be able to provide some financial support to practices that are in a dispute so those are my top tips there's lots more that we could cover but those those will come up in our courses if you'd like to attend them so i'm going to hand back to oscar now i think and hopefully we've got some questions and answers we do thank you very much everybody and um, do as we go into this q a section now for the for the last 15 minutes of the, of the session do put your questions in the, the box you've got quite a few that have come in but we'd love to get more um i suppose the first one that would perhaps jump out following on from what you've just said claire is is, is, is sorry, apologies, and the role that that has. Got a few different questions there. Um, the one that jumped out to me um, was from Shams, um, saying, Claire, do you, feel, do you feel that apologies can be overused to the point that it may negate the desired effect? Any thoughts? I can't say I've ever felt that myself, but perhaps others have. I, I don't, I, I, no, I don't feel that there is. I, I'm quite comfortable saying sorry, and I think it can really help diffuse things, uh, particularly to say sorry for how somebody is feeling, rather than sorry for the problem, if you know it wasn't anything to do with you that caused it. Um, and I, I do find sometimes in a mediation, with it being a legally privileged setting like we talked about, it is often a lot easier to get apologies and sorries than it might otherwise have been. With disputes in general practice in particular, I find that GPs often aren't comfortable engaging in any sort of productive way with a dispute until they know they're in the without prejudice setting and they can really say whatever they want without impunity. Mm -hmm. I, I can see there in the question list, there's uh, uh, Andrew, thanks Andrew, saying, doesn't saying sorry acknowledge responsibility? Now that's a question that we should perhaps defer to your MDU representatives, but it's not quite as, it's not quite as clear cut as that is, is, is my legal understanding, but I leave my lawyer's hat along a few, a few years ago. Um, Sarah, I, add, I, mean, I was going to say, could uh, I add just something to, to, to that, which is, um, I think how you say sorry is really important um, and, and makes a difference to whether that apology really means something uh, to the person um, it's being said to. So one tip that I would give is to perhaps think about moving away from the I'm sorry you feel that, but but helping to acknowledge how they're feeling by saying, I'm so sorry that what's happened whatever that is, has made you feel X, Y, or Z, because then you're acknowledging um, the reality of how they're feeling. It's not accepting responsibility or condoning it or agreeing with it, but it's acknowledging that what they're feeling in that moment is how they're feeling. And that's really important, I think, in, in mediation, in conflict resolution. You're not, you're not getting on their side, but you're actually saying, we we're acknowledging that you're feeling this and we're sorry that you're feeling that and i think that that can make a difference we don't want to overuse the word sorry um so sometimes that can be an issue that's a really good point sarah there are i would only add that there are certain if you're going to resolve conflict there are generally speaking some preconditions that you're going to need to meet for someone to be able to move forward and that more often than not is a sense that they have been seen and that their viewpoint is being heard and they feel like they're being acknowledged and that they're everything they're being treated as having a valid perspective i think if you can if you can help someone feel that way that is that is the first door you've really got to walk through in conflict to be able to get to the other side so that's your kind of your main mission and it really conflict resolution is an exercise in listening um yeah. it's about it's about it's not about explaining better it's about listening better and exploring better Oscar, I was just saying we, there was a question there from someone who's got to leave and they wanted the dates of the next oh. quarter. So very quickly, you could stick them up on the screen, but also just to let you know, the conflict with patients is on the 18th of November. Here we go. Conflict with colleagues on Friday, November the 26th. So we hope that you'll see, we will see some of you in, in one of those. So some, some really interesting questions. Thank you. Um, one that caught my eye was uh, Rachel, thanks Rachel for this question, which is how important is insight 
in finding resolution. <laughs> Sarah, uh, your are you are handing that one to me? Okay. Um, I think we as mediators have to help and support people to be able to have insight. And I'm sorry if that's a bit of a roundabout way of saying it. We can't assume that people are going to be willing to engage and we can't assume that they're going to want to resolve things. The more we can do to help acknowledge the position that they're in, the more chance we may have of helping them to dig below the surface and to see their feelings and or their behaviours through the lens of the other people. And that doesn't come automatically. I was interested in the question about the uh, workplace, the, the mediation, where they'd called in an external mediator and the feeling was that actually one of the parties was simply saying what the mediator wanted them to hear. I think as a mediator, we have to be quite rigorous in trying to help everybody dig below the surface and reality test some of the things that people are saying and the agreements that people make, um, because we don't want to skin the surface. You know, If we're feeling that we are, then those agreements may well fall, fall apart. Um, later on. So the more we've been able to um, to get to the bottom of that iceberg, the more the agreements and solutions, I think, are likely to stick. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. Um, some brilliant questions here from everyone. So next, one that's caught my eye here is from Angela. As Angela said, um, what's your advice when one side of the conflict refuses to engage in conflict resolution, particularly if that individual is the senior GP partner? So what I would say is that when when one understands the principles of mediation and how it's voluntary, uh, without prejudice, no obligation to reach an agreement and confidential, you can see that there isn't really any reason not to participate in a mediation other than i suppose the cost perhaps of the mediation so you're not going to make things any worse for yourself legally you can get up and leave at any point if it's getting too uncomfortable and if at the end of the day you decide actually i'm just not comfortable with this agreement that we've come to you don't have to commit to it uh, and once that's explained to people, I, I've never found somebody that is then not willing to come to the table. But I appreciate that you're not able to just do a mediation yourselves and bring that person on board. But it might be that that person isn't engaging because they're only going to engage in the conflict when all of those principles are in place. And that's that, that's sad in a way, but that's just sometimes how it is. Does that answer the question? I think so. It, it's, it's mediation isn't a panacea and it's not something, it's an invitation and it's an invitation that you can extend that doesn't necessarily need to be taken up. I mean, Claire's saying most of the time it is, but especially in the workplace mediation work that I do, sometimes people don't want to, don't feel it's something they want to do. And uh, I think it's an interesting thing as a mediator to, to respect that and to respect people's decision not to proceed as well. Um, can I throw another question out to you both here from Charlotte? Hello, Charlotte. Um, so I really, really struggle when a patient or relative becomes angry not to be affected emotionally by that. Do you have any advice with not taking things to heart? Does it become easier? I, thank you so much for that question, Charlotte. Um, Sh shall I go first and then, then Claire? I think, um, I think that's where the PIN model can come in, actually, and be quite useful um, because conflict can feel really hurtful. I think where we want to support people to get to is a place where instead of feeling um, attacked or wounded and feel that we need to defend ourselves, that actually we want to step back into a place, if we can, of being curious and empathic and thinking what is it that's going on for this person which is making them behave like this now i absolutely acknowledge that that is not easy to do but we need to in order to build confidence i think in order to be able to uh, manage conflict as a phenomenon it is a phenomenon but it doesn't feel like that it feels like something really horrible when we're in the middle of it the more we can think of it as a thing that we have to recognize and manage the more we may be able to step back from it and think actually it's not about us it's about what's going on for them 
and that takes time to do um, but I think it's a really important aspect of the management of it for ourselves. Claire I'm sure you've got something to add to that. Mm. And I think it's particularly important to think back to that big word cloud that we saw and that if everybody would feel as you're feeling in that conflict it's not mm. unusual that you're feeling that way but recognize it and take a step back what i do when i have a bad experience like that is i will instant message one of my colleagues and they know i don't do that very often and i'll say oh, yeah, i've just had a terrible encounter with a patient and they'll come up and they'll bring me a cup of tea and we'll have a chat perhaps about what happened or perhaps just about something else completely and it's just a nice five minutes for me to reset and it makes me feel so much better so i would encourage you to do that if you can do that in your practice or in your team but don't take it personally because the way you're feeling isn't is um is would be felt by everybody it's so easy to do though isn't it i mean if someone is there shouting at you or blaming you for something it's very difficult not to internalize that to a degree um but it's not yes as, as claire and sarah have both put it it's not it's not necessarily about you in mm -hmm. that situation shall yes. i there's just a Please. couple of questions in there um which we can answer if you put up our uh contact page oscar one of the questions is um would we would we be able to do patient conflict sessions for gp trainees and the answer is yes and here are all of our contact details the second mmf question was are we a charity um we're a not-for-profit organization um and and we deliberately set ourselves up in that way um partly because we our initial work was started with with charitable grants um but also because that's the way we wanted to be uh, as a not-for-profit organization so that we can channel um any any excess back into the work that we do yeah brilliant thank you very much so so many uh brilliant questions um coming in um this one from christine um how often is a mediator using conflicts between medical teams um that that is an interesting question part of what we do we do one-to-one -one conflict work both between parents patients and, and clinical staff as well as uh, colleague to colleague mediation but an increasing amount of our time is spent trying to help clinical teams work better together or navigate relationships between different clinical teams now it's it's a, it's really tricky work it's really it's really difficult work because you're not just in a, in a mediation between two people you have two competing emotional narratives two competing viewpoints in a team you've got 12 in two teams you've got 30 and so that it becomes very very complex and difficult to navigate um claire any thoughts on that from your work with teams in, G, in a gp setting <laughs> well again they're very complex and every situation is completely unique and utterly unique although of course there are themes that i've talked about already about communication in particular and meeting and getting together frequently I don't think I have anything else to add, except I, I did pick up an interesting comment in the question box, which might be a nice positive to finish on, perhaps. Uh, someone has said, I found over the years that my relationship with patients with whom a conflict was resolved can be really strong, honest, meaningful and mature. My patients and I have grown up together. And that just shows you that's because everybody there has understood what's going on under each of each other's iceberg and there's more of an understanding between the two now i thought that was a lovely positive note to end on and it and it really gets away from that you know avoidance behaviors in conflict doesn't it when we're able to acknowledge that there is a conflict and step into that brave space where we're going to talk about it and hopefully resolve it the feeling that you have when a situation is resolved is like a weight being taken off people's shoulders um but the the, the difficult first step is to acknowledge that that elephant is there in the room in the first place. But, you know, I think the good news is we, it can be done and we've seen it done and, and the impact that that can have. Well, brilliant. If you'd like to find out a bit more about that, as we shared, we've got some courses with the MDU on managing conflict with, with patients and managing conflict with colleagues, two different courses. Um, if you'd like to go on those, it'd be great to see you there. Um, otherwise, it's two o'clock uh, and, yes. and that's the session over. Thank you so much for all of your engagement and your time. I hope there was some interesting material for you there. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.